All right, and we are recording. And welcome to Money Matters. This is, uh, for me, the final uh, webinar for the Australian Small Business Advisory Services, the ASBAS uh, uh, program. The program uh, finishes on the 30th of June. And uh, how can I even come back? No dramas. Uh, the program finishes on the 30th of June, and um, this has been supported by Business, uh, Business Station, Regional Development uh, Australia, and Treaty. So uh, thank you to all of those that have made this possible. We've had some fantastic webinars and some incredible uh, feedback that uh, people have been really enjoying them. For me, though, it's been, uh, it's been a great journey, and this is my, uh, I, I believe this will be my last one. As I say, the program uh, is coming to an end. There's a new program starting in uh, August, from the 1st of August, uh, but it's a very different format. And so I don't know that uh, these will be even part of it. All right, so let's just jump in. Uh, money matters, why cash is king. And so what I'll do tonight, uh, I'm going to go through, uh, firstly, some a definition, why does money matter? Then we'll look at the systems at work, we'll look at your mindset around it some building blocks and some top tools for maximizing your money. There is a group exercise that we have as part of the, this uh, presentation, but look, we probably won't get to it. But I am keen to make sure that you get as much value from tonight as possible. Uh, and those that have been on webinars with me before will know that uh, it's kind of like drinking from a fire hydrant. I do tend to go through a lot of stuff pretty quickly. Uh, what I would suggest though, is you keep notes that make sense to you. So uh, if you, whether it's something that I say, or whether it's uh, something that uh, in, is inspired in you, or you think of something, take down the, those notes. That's what I want you to do. Now, when I uh, go onto a webinar or a, a, you know, pre COVID, actually go to a workshop, quite often the things that I write down are not what are being discussed, but what, that discussion is bringing out in me. And it's specifically what I wanna do and what I wanna take away as action. So if you can do the same, I think you'll get a lot out of tonight. Uh, the chat window is there, the Q&A window is there. Um, I can see that uh, you guys have already found the chat window and great, you're kicking it, killing it, fantastic. If you do have any questions, I'm just gonna keep going. So uh, slow me down if I talk too fast. That's fine, I apologize. But I do kind of run at a fairly uh, fast pace. So if you do find I'm going too quickly or there's something that you don't understand or a question that specifically you want answered, uh, please pull me up. And if you are watching this as a recording, you can't do any of those things. So stick by. All right, so let's move on. Why does money matter? Well, it seems pretty obvious we're all in business. And yet, why are you going through this first? Well, because quite often I have found that even uh, in business owners, this idea of money can be confusing, let's say. So let's just talk about the definition. Why does, it, why does money matter? Firstly, it keeps food on the table. You, it's a great way of uh, making sure that you can eat tomorrow. It enables growth. So not only do funds uh, a label allow you to survive, but they also enable your business to grow. And we're gonna talk about opportunity funds a little bit later. It provides choices. Now, if you don't have uh, enough cash, you can't make choices about, or well, it certainly restricts your choices about what you can do. I work with a lot of kids uh, who look to start up their own enterprises within schools. And quite often they'll say, oh, you know, I'm going to give all my, uh, my, the proceeds away to a particular charity. And I find that noble, but if you give, all away, uh, give away all of your funds, you can't then invest. And so the first thing that you need to invest in is yourself. And for certainly for a lot of small businesses, when they put on staff for the first time, they will sacrifice their own wages to make sure the staff get paid. And while that, I guess, is acceptable for in the short term, long term, what happens is that the owner, or you, if you happen to be the owner, uh, burn out. What am I doing this for? I'm not even getting paid. So while 
And even in without staff, if you're sacrificing your own wage, if you're not paying yourself, fair enough. As long as it's only for the short term and you can see a way out. If you can't seek professional help, either book a one-on-one -on -one with me or your accountant or whatever, and actually go and find out what you can do to change it. Because if you keep bashing your head against the wall and not getting ahead, it will break you. So it provides choices. But I find it's also a great way of just keeping score. Are we doing well or not? What's the cash flows position? And while it's not the only way to keep score, it is a way to keep score. And if for some reason you've got it in your head that you don't deserve a lot of money, that's fantastic. That's fine. If that's where your head's at, I understand. But can we just use it to keep score? Now, I have also come across people who think, uh, well, I don't need a lot of money. And that's fine. I've got no dramas with that mindset. You don't need a lot of money. Fine. But can we use it to keep score? So hopefully that will uh, start. It starts to get into your head that really what I'm going to be talking tonight about. And as I said, uh, I think we say in the in the prelude to this, this is not an accounting uh, seminar. This is not an accounting workshop. OK, I did study accountancy and I have done lots of accounting work, but I am not an accountant. So let's have a look at what it would be to change your mindset. And one of the first things I say is, look, just for 15 minutes per week, actually have a think about your money. Where is the cash in your organisation? What is going on with your personal budget? And even just 15 minutes per week, if you're consistent, will change the way you see your cash. It'll change the way you therefore see your business. And Honestly, you'll sleep better at night. Because our cash flow is one of the reasons, main reasons that businesses go under. It is one of the major reasons for stress. Now, of course, toxic customers, uh, toxic staff, uh, COVID are all other reasons. But one of the most consistent ones is you're running very lean. You don't have enough profits to, to go around and you're trying to cut back and cut, ex, uh, cut expenses at every opportunity. Meditate on it. Now, I don't mean sort of cross your legs and assume the lotus position and hum or chant or whatever your particular style is. I mean, actually look at it, pull it apart, write yourself a little budget, Spend 15 minutes thinking through where you're at. The second point, pay yourself first, wherever you can. If you can't right now, I get it, that's fine, short term. But where you can, aim to pay yourself first. Try to negotiate once per week. It's not something that we do a lot of uh, in this country. Uh, if you go overseas, uh, if you if you travel to say, you know, uh, many of the Asian countries, uh, certainly within Africa, you barter, you you exchange, you negotiate all the time. But given uh, here in Australia, if you go up to Col go through the checkout at Coles, and they say that'll be uh, eighty seven dollars, you say, look, I'll, I'll, let's make it sixty, and I'll buy an extra something from you. That's not going to happen, right? And so we don't get that opportunity. So if you can start to look at your negotiation skills and try and negotiate once per week. Now that may be with a supplier, that may be with a customer. If you get really stuck, that might be with your kids, your partner. Just start to put these things in place, start to negotiate once per week. And I have found that that makes a big difference because you start to see that things, just because somebody says a price does not mean that that price is set in stone. If I came to you and what have we got? Uh, unattended sales, hidden tours. Okay, if I said I wanted a particular tour, but uh, I've only got a, you know, I've got 90% of that, that the required fee, but not no more. Do you think there would be a, a thing in your mind to say, well, you know, maybe I can cut it by 10% just for this once. 
Or if I said, uh, I can do that, but you know, I can give you something in return, would you consider that as a negotiation? Would any of you uh, people on the call tonight or on the webinar tonight, would you consider negotiating with your services or products? Excellent. All right, fantastic. So the fact that you're willing to do that, remember that others are too. And I guess, you know, maybe I'm preaching to the choir. Maybe you already know all of this and do this, but if you don't, um, try and put in a negotiation once per week. Create yourself an opportunity fund. Now, the first thing that happens when I say this is how much? Now, let's go back before that. What is an opportunity fund? So an opportunity fund is uh, for your business. If you needed to, if you saw an opportunity for something, let's say you're purchasing, uh, you, you know, you've got a regular supplier and they've got something that is a really good price, but you have to buy a lot of it. The opportunity fund allows you to do that. If you're always, always running super lean, when an opportunity for an, uh, a deal, a bargain comes along, you can't take it up. And so, this, as I said, the first question that always comes up is how much? And it, I'm going to break my own rules here and say it depends on your business. What it is, I'm not, you're not allowed to say it depends, by the way. Uh, so, if you create an opportunity fund, you base it on the type of uh, deals that you might see within your business. Now, if you regularly supply, uh, buy very large amounts of a certain type of product, you have a, have a guess at what you think that might be. So it might be as low as you know, $500, $1,000. It might be as high as $10,000. Now, if you say I need an opportunity fund of $10,000, that's fantastic. Doesn't mean you need it straight away, but you need to start creating it. And I find that this, uh, in terms of your mindset, is seeing cash as a way of taking advantage of opportunities, not, just, not just a way of keeping score. All right? So it's not just those things. It is more than that. Uh, does anyone on the call actually have already an opportunity fund? Also... Um, while you're busy typing answers to that, um, you all just need to say yes or no, that's fine. Uh, take superannuation and insurance seriously. Okay, so we, have, we don't have opportunity funds yet. So have a think about that. If you have questions about uh, specifically about what that might look like for you, um, certainly type them into the chat window. But realistically, think about it as uh, I do want you to be able to take opportunities when they come up. All right. Though this is say luck is when opportunity meets preparedness. Well, an opportunity is coming your way, guaranteed. At some point, you're going to see the opportunity to grow, to move, to change, to do whatever. Have something put aside that you can consider it. May not be enough, but it's uh, something. Uh, superannuation and insurance. Uh, superannuation. Um, can be, you know, and talk to your accountant about how you can use your super really, really effectively. Um, everything from getting started in startups now are using their super uh, to um, obviously the retirees uh, using their super to do certain things. COVID's have changed the rules a little bit around that um, for the better. Uh, and insurance. It seems odd that, uh, maybe it seems odd that I'm talking about insurance, but insurance allows you to mitigate your risks. And one of the things that we look at quite a lot when we do uh, business roadmaps and stuff like that is what are the risks and what is your risk exposure? If I look at buying into any business and you should think of your business as uh, something that is for sale. Uh, the reason for that is that you will look at it as if, if you were going to buy your own business, would you? It's an interesting question, hey? 
Now, when I look at buying a business, buying a business or buying into a business, one of the first things I look at is, are we at risk? What are the risks? I always look at the risks first. And adequate insurance can uh, mitigate those risks. Now, not insurance isn't going to mitigate all your risks, obviously. If you have a bad business model or, uh, you know, COVID, um, you're not ready for it, then insurance isn't going to help. But it certainly can, you take it seriously and you look at the things that make sense to insure against. I am not an insurance agent. I never have been. I don't know in any great, well, I actually know a couple of good insurance agents, but I'm not going to tell you who they are. So this is not for my benefit. This is for you to make sure that whatever you do going forward, you're safe. Why is this in the, the money? One, because you don't want to lose what you've worked for, right? You work hard and you're going to overcome lots of struggles. I have, it's been a theme um, and I talk to quite a, a lot of different coaches well, hundreds actually of different coaches. Uh, and they all say the same thing that we get themes. Uh, one of the themes for this week um, and certainly the, the week before is that business is hard. Business should not be hard, right? Don't accept that business will always be hard. It should not be. Um, I only bring this up because it has been a, a recurring theme for the last week and a bit. Um, people coming in, businesses that I'm coaching for the first time that start with business is hard. Well, okay, it may be slightly difficult at the moment, but we're going to put tools in place so that it isn't. So don't accept that that's the way it should always be. Again, probably preaching to the choir, you probably already all know that, but it was on my mind, so I thought I'd bring it up. Um, if there are any questions on your mindset or if there's something specifically that is in your mind that uh, you feel is slowing you down, um, please put it in the chat window, but I'm going to keep going. All right. Um, let's look at some of the building blocks for uh, increasing the flow of money. And money, like ideas, doesn't like to be pulled. Uh, I did this... Uh, oh, I guess it's been my philosophy for, I don't know, 25, 30 years, is that if you hold an idea too tight, you kill it. And not only that, the next idea doesn't come. And so I think in terms of flow, uh, lots and lots of flow, lots of ideas, uh, I am just a vessel for ideas to flow through and our business is just a vessel for money to flow through. If you can think about it in terms of a flow, what is flowing in and what is flowing out? Now, if you massively try to reduce your expenses, um, you're prohibiting the flow out. And sure, I'm not saying don't minimize your expenses, but focusing on too much can throttle your business. Also, income. Throttling down your expenses can affect your uh, income. So keep in mind that as we talk about this, that I'm, I'm actually referring to flow. So look at budgeting and reducing debts. So um, now, reducing debts is not universally a good idea. It's a good idea if it is a debt uh, where you are paying interest, where you can um, use other people's money and the interest rates are crazy low, which they are at the moment, uh, sometimes it's actually better. The way you work this out is uh, look at your cash flow forecast. So if you had to keep, uh, if you had to supply uh, the funds for your own growth, what does that look like? And what would it look like if you managed to get a loan to do so? Um, at a reduced, at, at, at such a low interest rate. The next thing is to set some clear goals around what you want your cash flow to be. And it's an interesting one. I, I, I work with um, 
so many different businesses. And one of the first things we do, uh, because coaching is very much outcome focused, I want to know the outcome that they're looking for. So if you come in and say, I need to make more money, I'm like, great, fantastic, how much and by when? So in terms of your flow of money, actually have some clear goals about what you want to do. Where do you want your cash to be going? Where is it currently going? And if you don't know, start digging into that. Use that 15 minutes of meditation time to start digging into your own finances. If, if you don't know what's going on in your business, you better find out. Your most important piece of information is what is going on in your business. Um, building a cash reserve, opportunity fund. We've already sort of covered that a little bit. Um, understanding your business metrics, your company metrics. And I guess for small businesses, this is a challenge because per sector or per industry and even per business, um, three ice cream trucks will probably have different metrics that they're measuring depending on where they are in their business life cycle. So understanding your business metrics is a fairly broad and possibly unhelpful statement. So getting into it, what we're trying to talk, what I'm talking about is, do you know what uh, your gross profit margin is, for example? Do you know uh, what it costs uh, to acquire a customer? So what's the cost, uh, customer acquisition, cost of acquisition? Do you know how much you make per product in, or service and which ones are more profitable? So uh, coaching someone just today and we were talking about they get work from a number of different suppliers. Uh, the, uh, uh, the guys are uh, a service provider and works through a number of different uh, companies, but also sort of works through his own. And the question was, well, how much time should I spend on my own business and how much time should I just work with these guys because they pay me reasonably well? Well, the answer comes from actually understanding the business metrics. And so we created uh, a spreadsheet and we looked through it and we actually put in how much he pays for the marketing, how much he pays for this, what it would look like, numbers all generated out the bottom and you can see what the difference was. You may already know all of that about your business. So what is the next thing for you? even just once a week, adding a new metric or even once a month. What is something you should be measuring? Because the word metric actually is about measuring, isn't it? Um, those that have been on other webinars with me will probably have heard if, if it's a business, you measure it. If it's a hobby, that's fine, don't bother. But if it's a business, we measure it. If it's important, you measure it. If cash is important, measure it. If customer satisfaction is important to you, measure it. If your own satisfaction is important, measure it. On a scale of one to 10, and I'll go through this for you because it's quite useful. On a scale of one to 10, how happy are you with your finances in business right now? Where one is, I just don't even know how to answer the question. It's so horrible. And 10 is, I am the master of my finances and I am teaching other people to do what I do. On a scale of one to 10, where would you be right now? Hopefully you've all got a number. The next question is, where would you like it to be? Now, you may not need to be a 10 uh, for your business. Um, maybe you do. So just understanding uh, what it is that you need for your business. Where would you like to be? Now, between your first number, where you are now, and your second number, where you would like to be, are some steps. What would it take to get up one step? 
measure that weekly. Where are you on understanding your finances? Where do you think you are right now? If it's important, you measure it. Now you see how that is a soft measure. There's no universal scale. You might think you're an eight, fantastic. As long as you think it, that's fine. So the tool that I'm giving you here is not where do you stand for your finances? The tool I hope you're taking away is what is important to me and what should I be measuring? Now, we're on Money Matters, the uh, webinar at the moment, so I'm hoping it's your money and your cash flow or your business metrics or your insurance. Where are you with your insurance? Are you comfortable or do you think you need more? And if you don't know, maybe find out. But as I say, the thing that I hope you take away is the fact that you can use these, this method to measure anything. Your relationships with your children, your relationships with your suppliers, a scale of one to 10, what we, where would you be? Always one is terrible, 10 is awesome, by the way. It gets around the fact that you guys flip the scales. If it's important, measure it. If you take nothing away from tonight other than that, you'll be very well served if you use it. Comprehensive financial planning. Now we're starting, we're moving beyond the understanding of your company metrics and we're looking at some financial planning. Now the financial planning industry has gone through a major overhaul. Um, they kind of hit a wall, let's be honest. And it came uh, from the Royal Commission. And I personally know three or four financial, no, four financial planners who have left the industry because of it. They can't make it work anymore. There's too much regulation. But that doesn't stop it being a good service. You just have to hunt a little bit harder for it. So once you understand your metrics, you've got a good cash reserve up, your budgets are good, then look at some comprehensive financial planning and finally investment advice. Now, if you're just making ends meet, investment advice will seem like it is an eternity away. Maybe it just seems like it's next year. Whatever it is, even if it's right now, if it's right now, go for it, 100%. Get some investment advice. Any questions on any of that? Because what we're doing, remember, was we're, we're starting small and we're building up. But if you don't actually start with budgeting, you don't actually know where you're at. So that for any journey, you have to start with a starting point. You have to actually know your starting point. That's why when we do that, that exercise of where are you on a scale of one to 10, you start with where you are right now. Then you project where you would like to be. But if you don't start with where you are right now, it's really hard to project. Does that make sense? All right. Um, if there are no questions and you guys have uh, probably all gone off to have dinner, but I'll keep going anyway. Let's look at some uh, top tools for maximizing your money and your flow budgets. So uh, budgets are massively important. They're your guess, right? What do you guess is going to happen? What? So uh, firstly, your personal budget, kind of know where it is. Uh, your mortgage, your repayments, how much do you spend on food? How much do you spend on fuel? That's you personally. Then the business, same deal. How much you spend on this? How much you spend on that? Set yourself a bit of a budget. Remember, uh, in all of my webinars, uh, one of the things that I do focus on is that the tools must serve you. We do nothing for the tools. The tools do. We are not a servant of the tools. So, when you do a budget, what are the things that you'd like to know about? What are the things that would help you make better decisions? Now, for me, um, our household budget, it helps me make decisions. Doesn't impact me quite so much now, but I've still got it. 
My business budgets, however, I have one for every single business that I run. So we do have a budget, we do look at it, we estimate what's going on. And then if we get it completely wrong, the question is why? What assumption had we made that we, sh that we got wrong? And could we have known about it earlier? Is there something we could have asked to make sure that assumption wasn't wrong? Guessing is incredibly important because if you don't start guessing, you won't get better at it. Predicting what's gonna happen in the future is literally just a guess. But the more you do it, the better you get at it. As an example, uh, a fairly complex one, uh, I work with a, a personal injury lawyer uh, firm or law firm uh, in the US and I got them to, you know, what happens is someone comes in, they've got an injury or they'll phone and they decide to take the case on or not take the case on. And they were just sort of just taking on everybody, whoever phoned. And what, what happens is some of them become massive burdens to the business. And so what we did was uh, we started getting them to guess what they think the case would be worth after the first interaction. So whether it was the first phone call or they came into the office or whatever, the idea was they'd create the file, they'll turn the file over and they write on the back how much they think that case was going to settle for. Then they would move forward with the case. At the end, they would turn the thing over and write the actual number and then between the two, try and work out why they got it wrong. After a year of this, they are massively accurate at guessing what's happened. And it can be all sorts of things, things that you would never have guessed. The way they, they held their head tilts when they talk about the, the doctor that they've seen so far, the information they give about their doctor, the way they discuss the accident itself. All of this helps them because they know they're gonna have a guess and their brain has seen this before now because of that guess. So what actually happens now is the ones that they feel aren't going to be worthwhile, they recommend, oh, look, this is probably outside our specialty. We'll recommend you somewhere else. As a result, their income has quadrupled in the last two years because they're picking their clients better. The same kind of thing happens for you. Start with your budget and guess what you think it's going to be. You'll get better at guessing. It's like setting time estimates against the tasks you have each day. You should be doing that. And if you're not, please do. Um, because they're going to be guesses and you're going to get it wrong. And that's perfectly fine. That's expected. But you can't get better at it unless you start getting it wrong. Unless you start doing it. Okay. Let's have a talk about some, again, always pull me up if you want. Um, key business indicators, gross profit margin. Who knows what their gross profit margin is before they came into this call? Gold star if you did. Sales funnel conversions and drop-off rates. 100%, 100%, excellent. Well done. So um, in terms of your sales funnel, one of the things that uh, happens uh, quite a lot in my coaching sessions is someone will come in and say, I need help with marketing. So... If you don't know what your conversion rate is, we can turn the funnel on and I can bring in a thousand leads for you. But if your conversion rate is 1%, wouldn't it be better to fix the conversion rate before we turn on the sales tunnel and lose all of those leads? And if you, so sales funnel conversion or conversion rates and drop off rates. So how big is the hole at the bottom of your funnel? Someone comes in as a lead, you uh, convert them into a customer. Do they buy again? And sometimes, you know, in some industries, that's not a thing. And I get that. But if it is a thing for you, what is the drop off rate? How could you maximize that? Uh, what, is the, what is the retention rate? I guess is what you want to maximize. And if people are dropping out, are you getting referrals from those that left happy? And if not, why not? And can you? 
And the answer to these questions isn't always, yes, of course I should, and yes, I'll get around to it. Sometimes it doesn't make any sense. But if it does, and you're not doing it, should you and will you? Maybe this is one of your priorities. What is your cost of acquisition? So how much do you spend to get one customer? I had a, a, a client in and we were talking about that. Uh, it was a, a couple of young gentlemen. And we worked out that their particular industry, their particular business model um, is a, like a three-year contract for anybody to come in. And at 30% of their first year income per client, they could spend $400 to acquire them or over $400 to acquire a, a single client. If you had $400 to woo one client only, do you think you could get them across the line? You could bribe them pretty well for $400, couldn't you? You can buy them dinner, you send them to a show, whatever it is, for $400, if that's what your cost of acquisition is, that's fantastic. If your cost of acquisition is $1 and you're selling $2 worth of stuff, Okay, fantastic, you're doubling your money. If your cost of acquisition is $1 and you're selling 50 cents worth of stuff, well, you're losing money. So knowing your cost of acquisition is quite useful. Again, question, does everybody know what their cost of acquisition is? Your account's payable. What's going on in that? Now, uh, this, is different for every business, obviously. Uh, but what I find is quite a lot of the trades tend to have a longer uh, accounts payable. Um, obviously, less is more here. And quite often, I'll find that a business has been doing, uh, has been trading for quite a while. And they'll have customers on all sorts of different payment plans. Or they'll have them on all sorts of different contracts or costs. You can bring them forward. You can bring them into the modern age. And you, what will happen is, and I, I guess the patterns that I have seen happen, is that where you have uh, budget customers and the, the, the offer has been evolving and you now have customers paying more, it's the budget customers that cost all the time. It just seems to be the way. And so you can say, right, well, you know, our service offering has changed. I'm now going to have to charge you this. We'll do it in, give them, a, give them a bit of warning. We'll do it in three months' time. We'll work up to that or whatever it's going to be. Um, and if for whatever reason you really can't afford it, uh, I'll try and find you someone else who can service you. It's a great way of actually working working with your existing clients and making sure that everybody's up or up to speed on what your current service offerings are and what your pay terms will be. Um, one of your big your big tools is your cash flow forecast, and I will have done hundreds of these because I'll do one for every single business idea I have just to see if it's going to work. Um, you might do it per month. So create a spreadsheet, you know, for the next 12 months, you've got the months along the top, then you've got the number of clients, then the average sale price per client. And you start to work towards what will it look like and what can I change in my business? Where are the key points that make a difference in my business and what do they actually mean? Now, if you've never done this, it may seem like a bit complicated, but it will be absolutely worth your while to actually start to see and project what will happen if you changed your business. So the business I was talking about before, uh, when we were looking at uh, the cost, uh, the profit margins per different stream, uh, whether he works for somebody else or works for himself, when we started playing with the numbers, very quickly we could see that if you could tweak a couple of these key points, which is not possible working under the other under this other 
supplier, under his own steam, he can tweak those a little bit and massively change his outcome, his income, uh, his output for the business. And so it helped make that decision because just looking at the base figures, just doing it in your head, they looked about the same. There wasn't any real imperative for him to run his own show. But when we got down to it, absolutely made a lot of sense. So cash flow forecast. If you can do one, fantastic. If you massively get stuck, um, book in, we'll sort one out. Um, another one, your market share. Now there are these, and this is not a list of all the things you should just know about your business, right? But this is a really good starting point. Do you know what your market share is? Do you know how big your market is? Again, when I'm looking at a business to either buy or start, uh, one of the things I look at is how big is the potential market? Uh, I started Coaching Life magazine uh, back in 2015. And the first thing I did was analyze the market. So how many uh, coaches are out there? It's a magazine for coaches. And so I looked at how many uh, life coaches, business coaches, and sports coaches. Turns out there was a, at that stage in Australia about 10,000 life coaches about 20 to 25,000 uh, business coaches. It's hard because business coaches and consultants, they change their name. Um, and then I looked at the sporting and it took me about three days to work it all out. I just got lost in the figures. Um, but the answer came back at about 460,000. Now, if I'm starting up a product and I can uh, either target, so I'm at the crossroads, I can either target at 10,000, 35,000, or 460 plus 35, 400, five, nearly 500,000, which do you think is probably going to be the best way forward? And so understanding where the, what the market could look like allowed me to tweak the product so that the product would suit that particular market. And as it turns out, it's done really well because business coaches share information with sporting coaches and sporting coaches can share information with life coaches and, and vice versa. And so actually going across the borders of coaching actually worked in my favor, but it was driven by the market share information. What was the potential market? So do you know what, uh, for your business, just a quick question, uh, yes or no, do you know what your market share is at the moment? OK, so just start to find out, start to ask the question, what's going on? The more information, and this might seem quite arbitrary, but the more information you can have on your industry, the more you are an expert at it. And when you're an expert in your industry, you speak with confidence. And when you speak with confidence, clients, clients are more likely to engage and take your services. Now, there's almost, as far as I know, there's no one who knows more about coaching in this country than me. And it's not because I'm massively bright. It's because I've interviewed most of them. Well, not 460,000, obviously. I'm only up to about 500 now. But in terms of elite coaches in sport, so all of our Olympic coaches, all of our Paralympic coaches, I accept Victor Kovalenko, sailing coach, could not get him for love nor money. He's always on the water. Um, but all of those coaches, all of the business coaches, all of the life coaches, I've actually managed to go out and interview them. I know what's going on in the industry. Uh, I follow the Facebook groups. I check in on things. Are you? What are you doing in your industry to set yourself up as the expert? Do you if, knowing your own market is probably your first step? Knowing who your major competitors are and keeping an eye on them. Awesome. We call that environmental scanning. So environmental scanning is looking at the environment in which your business operates. Now that will be the legal uh, risks, COVID, uh, competitors, uh, your suppliers, your customers, your staff, all of those bits and pieces. Without excluding anything, all of that gives you great information. 
Now, you're a small business owner, so there's limits. But if you had to look at that list, what could you spend time on a little bit, maybe an hour this week? Where are we? Monday. Awesome. Still this week. To take it forward, to understand more, to have more information going forward. Could you work out your market share? You know how many clients you have, how many. Um, now, I'm, what have we got? Uh, we've got a seller brand. We've got, let's talk about that, that for a second. How many people are getting married in your particular area? So how many weddings? And does that change over time? And certainly with COVID, you know, that all dried up. But understanding what that looks like Start to track that in some way. Is there some way you could work out how to track what was going on? Now, if you can do that, then you get the benefit of that. You can start to work out what your potential market is, and that will tell you what your potential marketing should be, who you should be targeting. It gives you more information about to make better choices, better decisions. Understand your market share, look at your cash flow forecast, look at your cost of acquisition. Understand what your conversion rate is. So don't throw leads at your funnel if your conversion rate isn't good. Fix that first. So just moving through that sort of stuff, understand where you think you are right now and where do you think you could be going forward? Um, I've got a question, uh, is white spacing a good way of, uh, to look at market share? Look, uh, it is, a, it is a way, um, but look for me, uh, I actually go looking at where everything, uh, where are my local clients? So, um, so white spacing talks about the, the, the needs that are in the market and what's going on. Um, but realistically, I look for, unless it's a, an industry that really we have no competitors, and even then there'll be something that's similar that we can pull that on. So I tend to look at who else is in the market and how much, uh, rather than sort of looking for this is where I want to go to acquire market space. I look at what market share actually exists at the moment. What market space is there in this market? Um, I guess it's a fine definition, but for me, uh, try. I, I start with uh, who knows what I don't know? Who already has this information? So one of the things you can do is uh, in terms of who has uh, information about the market is your competitors will have some information about the market. Even if it's only information about their portion of the market, still information. Um, the Queensland Government Statistician's Office, you can always ask them what's going on in a particular region. Uh, they are funded to answer statistical questions. If you didn't know that, that's a good tip. Queensland Government Statistician's Office. Uh, I actually wrote a system for them to track down, track uh, their requests um, and how long they were spending on it because they had to report back to uh, Parliament about that. But it's a great way. You can Google stuff and look, I'm not anti-Googling, but where possible, if you can ask a human, do that. You'll get better information. You may not always get more accurate information, but you, the chances are you're going to get better information because they might realize the question you're asking isn't actually the question you should be asking. Whereas Google will just give you the answer to your question. And if it's a badly formed question, you'll get badly formed answers. Again, now you know, this is my philosophy. You do what, what works for you. But for me, my first question is, once I realize I don't know something, is 
who would already have that information? Who can I phone that might already know this or send an email to who might already know this? What organizations already know this? Um, at this point, you know, in, in a, a workshop environment, we'd be talking about where is your cash going? What are the key metrics that you have that you don't already know about? And how often do you think you should be checking them? And I guess you can do this for yourself. You can actually start to think about where is your cash going? Do you actually have your finger on the pulse? And if you do, fantastic. And if you don't, what will you do to start to do that? There's no judgment, okay? And don't be critical with yourself that you don't know stuff. You just, you haven't got there yet. Everybody starts uh, at the same thing, knowing nothing and learning it as they go. So the tools that we've talked about, if you've not used them before, that's fine. Everybody's had to learn to use them and you can too. But a lot of this has been talking about numbers, right? Maths is not my strong suit, but I can do this. And if I can do it, you can too. So have a think about what your metrics, uh, your key metrics are for your business. And as I say, each business will have different key metrics. And your metrics will change over time. So right now, if you don't know your market share, you might start measuring what's going on in the market as much as you can. But after a while, you might already you might decide that you already know that, and so stop measuring it. The measurements and the metrics should serve you. So if they're allowing you to make better decisions, keep doing them. If they're not, stop. All right. Um, it is... Uh, 54 minutes in, uh, five minutes to go. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, please put them up. But one of the things I'd like you to do if, if, well, firstly, if you've already taken down a bunch of ideas, what I want you to do is prioritize those and pick the first one. Put a timeline, a time against it. How long do you want to spend on it? And then work towards that. If you haven't taken any notes at all, and that's fine, what I would suggest is if you don't already have one, do yourself a favor and do a cash flow forecast. Then look at what your key business indicators that you would like to know based on that cash flow forecast, and then move on to the budget. Just work out what your starting point is. For me personally, the cash flow forecast is the most important tool I use when I'm looking at a, a business for the first time. And you might already know this for yourself, so move on to the others. But if you don't, start there. It's a really useful way of understanding what's going on, the flow of business, of cash, sorry, in your business. Um, this is, as I say, the final, uh, for me, I think probably the final uh, webinar uh, in the series. Um, it has been uh, uh, an awesome opportunity to present um, some ideas. And I think so far we've had over 400 businesses uh, come through uh, these webinars. Uh, my, me personally, uh, my personal webinars. Um, but the team has said that uh, while ASBAS, this particular version of the ASBAS program will finish uh, on Wednesday, uh, that one-to-one -one coaching will still be available for those that have already been on a webinar or had any one-to-one -one coaching. So if you do want some more one-to-ones, as I say, the webinars and workshops are, will all be finished now, uh, but the one-to-one -one coaching is still available for July. Now, the, what I have been told uh, is that the uh, ASBAS program for August and going forward will not be available to uh, the, the participants of the first the first run of it. So you guys, which I think is quite a pity, but you know I don't get to set the metrics. The federal government sets that. So uh, take advantage of this while you can, is what I'm saying. You've got access to myself and all of the ASBAS advisors uh, if you've already signed up, which you have because you're here until the end of July. 
All right, um, that's it for me. If there are any questions, I'm going to stop the recording there. Uh, thank you for joining me and um, I will catch you around the traps. <laughs>